every once in a while you meet someone who's incredibly honest about their intentions on the internet. One such person could be Pine Creek Doug who made this video about himself. Kind of reminds me of a video that a certain person at Enron made about himself, Jeffrey Skilling. You might want to watch that video, it's quite amusing. He talked about how they were going to use hypothetical future valuation. And as you know now, Jeffrey Skilling is in the clink, Enron is in the tubes, and no longer in existence. But anyway, I digress. Here we are with Pine Creek Doug. Pine Creek Doug has some truisms that he would like to share. Who is he? Well, let's find out. I'm under the power of the evil one, sent by Satan to lead the, the youth, Christian youth, to hell. Well, I'll be darn. So I was explaining to Doug exactly how I came to where I am right now, how I decided to go back to school, what my background was. He was actually being very cordial and friendly and this is taking place a couple of years ago. So I thought I would highlight a couple of moments from this conversation. What's interesting is he likes to put us into different shoes, have us look at different perspectives and even the idea of having me reflect on myself, speaking of myself in the third person. So here we go. Can you be Bella right now though? Like, uh, I she okay she would say that i i gave my well i decided at that time that um or she, she would say that i decided at that time that i wanted to do something different and so i ended up working in a university lynn university teaching a course a marketing course and i really enjoyed it and so i decided i'd go back and get my phd because i wanted to be taken more seriously in this role and so i went back and earned that and uh and at that time i still wasn't a christian but bella would know that because she and i worked together and um and so all of these years passed and i um and i was looking for a deeper purpose and that's actually why i went back to earn my phd i wanted to find a deeper purpose and a deeper meaning in my life i felt like i wasn't using everything that i had been gifted with and okay, so Be i bella why did sj choose christianity to find deeper purpose and meaning in life I should preface this just so you don't know, or so, since you probably don't know who Bella is. In fact, I'm pretty sure you don't. There's no way you could possibly know who we're talking about. Bella is one of my coworkers, a really good friend of mine, who happens to be Jewish. And it's interesting because right now we're coming upon the Christmas holiday and Bella would right now be celebrating Hanukkah. She's been celebrating Hanukkah for a while. In fact, I just attended her youngest son's bar mitzvah uh, by Zoom. I also attended in person, actually, her other son's bar mitzvah a little while back. And she and I have talked about religious matters. We've talked about Christianity and we've talked about her Judaism. She's interesting because she married a person who was Christian at the time, his name's Dan, and she convinced him to convert to Judaism. So the whole family now is in the Jewish faith. And so I went to a synagogue for the second time when I went to visit her son's bar mitzvah a while ago, and it was interesting. But anyway, so Doug is wanting me to answer questions from the perspective that Bella would have about what she knows about my background. So here we go. Well, actually, Bella's Jewish. So, but what, so we. But why did I, SJ? Why did SJ choose Christianity to find deeper purpose and meaning in life, Bella? 
because she walked into a church and she had an experience that she felt uh, led her back to Christ. Okay, fair enough. And this experience was so powerful that, um, like, did SJ take to it right away? Did she have questions about it? Uh, or was it like a, basically, that was the pivotal moment where there was no turning back? What would SJ say to that? No, there was turning back. I actually, I, can I answer as SJ? Because <laughs> I really, I, she doesn't know. I haven't really, I, I don't know if I've really articulated exactly my entire experience to, to a lot of my friends. I, I know I have to my sister, but you didn't ask for a, a sister, you asked for. Um, so I haven't articulated this to, I, my husband would know. I mean, also, he's another one, knows I, the whole experience. Well, I, you don't have to tell me what the experience was uh, exactly, but... Um, but this experience that you had is you connected somehow to Jesus and Christianity. Is that correct? It, it was a, it wasn't just one experience. It was a, it was a series. And actually I could have turned back after the church and I actually kind of did. I was kind of wavering even after walking in the church and having this experience, I still was questioning even after getting baptized uh, again, I got born again, baptized in September, I don't know, six years ago or so. Uh, I, I was born again at that time, but I still was wavering. I still, in the back of my mind, wasn't completely sold, even though I thought I was. I wanted to do everything I could do because I felt something different inside of me, but I uh, wasn't sure. I, I was still questioning. I wasn't exactly what, sold 100%. What, what weren't you sure about? I wasn't... I was sure that there, in, in fact, in my entire life, I've always been sure that there's a higher power and there's a, a source of purpose and meaning because I, I feel. Um, but what weren't very you sure about about, that. about Christianity? I, I wasn't. I wasn't one hundred percent sure about Jesus's resurrection. And for you, that was that's the most important part of Christianity. Yes, I think that forms the foundation of Christianity. Okay, and why weren't you sure about the resurrection of Jesus? I hadn't accumulated proof. So I had, at that point, I still, you know, I wasn't someone who was, um, I was just new to the, the entire Bible. For many years, all I had was a teeny little New Testament that was given from my mother-in-law to my, my son when he was born. So I, I, I didn't have, um, uh, and, and for many years, I wasn't following Christianity. I was really studying. I thought the Eastern faiths were more interesting. Um, I had a, a, a few spiritual experiences and that sort of thing, but I still wasn't completely 100% sold. And it wasn't until um, it wasn't until I got onto a plane and I happened to be sitting next to a pastor uh, who told me that that he directed me to read C.S. Lewis's adult books. Uh, and then when I read C.S. Lewis's adult books, a lot clicked. And um, and then I just became really passionate about learning more. And at that point, I started having more spiritual experiences. And, uh, and I started learning more and understanding that the resurrection actually has a lot of backing. And, and I looked at to a lot of the um, uh, different people who found different reasons to support Christianity. I, I had a... a a dream and a vision of my my own and uh and i became closer and it's it's really neat because it's actually made me a better person like i'm actually nicer than i was you know <laughs> as funny as it sounds i i and i uh because i keep feeling um i mean it's it's amazing when you watch if you watch the passion of the christ and it's it's you watch it with the view that wow look what this man did for me and so I got to give Doug a lot of credit for letting me talk as much as I've been talking in here and sharing all of my story, because that is my story. It still uh, is, is resonating in my mind today, and I was glad to be able to share it all. So I'm wondering what this person is going to come up with, because I haven't watched this in a while, so I don't recall, and I'm actually just sort of watching this cold right now to see exactly what the response is going to be. He's, will he ask if I have enough evidence for the resurrection? Will he ask what the evidence is? Will he ask how sure I am? Will he ask on a scale from one to a hundred what my probability is that Jesus resurrected? I don't know. He uses a number of different approaches, but what he does is what they call street epistemology. So let's see what a typical street epistemologist is going to do. They're going to usually dig deeper into the story. And he didn't just do it for me. Look what this man did do for you, everyone. Do you, and, think, uh, do you think you were searching for the proof of Jesus's resurrection because of the experiences that you had? Have you seen any? 
Okay, so <laughs> got a little commercial here. So because of the experiences that I had, yes, actually, I have to admit, I have, when you have an experience where you see Jesus in a dream and you see him in a vision, certainly you want to find out more about the man. <laughs> Why was he in my dream? What was he telling me in the dream? What was in the vision? I need to know who this person is. I want to know all about him. And fortunately, we have a Bible where we can get that information. So that's pretty awesome. So stay tuned. We're going to go to another video interview with Pine Creek Doug. Here's another Christian. She's a New Testament student, a PhD student over at Duke. Her name's Laura Robinson, and it's my understanding that she and her husband, his name is John DePew, uh, he's got a thing called Apocalypse here. It's my understanding that they're both universalist Christians, which means that they feel that everyone will eventually give, be given salvation. And that would include people like Stalin and Hitler and anybody else you can imagine. They feel that eventually Jesus will open up to all of us, and they feel that that's biblical. However, I do actually believe in particularism with respect to Christianity, and I think Jesus makes that pretty clear, but that's another issue for another day. I find this uh, interaction here kind of amusing, though, so let's see what Pine Creek has to offer Laura Robinson. Okay. Today, it's a new name that I recognize. It's One Spoon at a Time. So, One Spoon at a Time, a thousand pine points for you. Where are pine points redeemable? Oh, good, great question. Right. So get this. If you get a million pine points, you get an all expense paid trip with me to the luxurious Tropicana Casino and Spa in Las Vegas, Nevada. Oh, good. What a slick dog with the music in the background. Woo, -hoo, charmer. All right, let's go. Let's listen to this portion of this debate or chat or conversation, whatever you want to call it. So again, uh, Christian versus atheist. Pine Creek versus Laura. Let's see how Pine Creek uses his street epistemology techniques and award of Pine Creek points to travel with him, with him to Las Vegas. <laughs> I wonder about John DePew. Is he going to be going too? I don't know. I don't know. Pine, Pine Creek is uh, romancing. I'm just kidding, Pine Creek. I'm just kidding. Okay, let's go. Do you think the gospel author of John invented things that read as historical, but are, didn't, are not historical? Um, so there's, a, there's, there's, there's a few ways to break this down, right? One is, did he, um, did he, uh, did he inherit these stories from someone else or did he invent them? Do I think there are things in John that are not historical? Yeah. Uh, where those came from, I think is a separate question. Did he get this from other stories that were known about Jesus or what I would also just say is probably the most likely place is they got them from prophetic oracles of people in the church who were still talking to the resurrected Christ, right? So the interesting part about that is, again, uh, one of the reasons why people who are universalists like to say that the Bible has some errors in it or the Bible has some non-historical content is because actually when you read the content in the Bible, you will find that Jesus said very clearly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through the Son. Jesus also gave parables such as the rich man and Lazarus, which made it very clear that there is a chasm between uh, heaven and hell. It also made it clear that Lazarus uh, made it to heaven, and the rich man, who was never given a name, was in sort of a hellish or a Hades type of existence, and in that particular instance, when the rich man asked the person who was sort of in charge there about what about his brothers, could his brothers be warned, the answer was that the brothers had been given the information through Moses and the prophets, and so that's something pretty clear. So these are some refutations of the points that are being made with respect to universalism and the Bible having some sort of historical errors. And to say it has historical errors, you have to make up an entirely different system of information. But anyway, again, I digress a little bit. Let's go to more Pine Creek interviews. I think right now we're going to focus on Craig Reed, because that's another Christian that Pine Creek had on his channel not too long ago. People who are Mormons on the ground floor in their day-to-day -day life are practicing kind of a reformed version of Christianity. Are they interacting with the Holy Spirit for real, potentially? Does that mean that all their doctrines are true? No. Does a Catholic or all their doctrines true? No, not necessarily. But that doesn't mean the essential part, the essential core. I'm telling you that I had a profound experience one night. You agree that I had a profound experience. Mm -hmm. Now you're trying to compare it with other experiences. Right. But the, fl the flaw of the comparison is, is faulty. 
though they may be having a genuine God experience within the framework, this is why it's more complicated than, than just these questions. They may be having a genuine supernatural experience within the framework where some of their cultural preconditions or some of their preconceived notions are interfering so that they're getting accounting for the variations in the experience. Does that make sense what I just said or no? Yeah, I think so. Um, but I guess if, 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 you were not, if you and I were talking to this guy who had this experience in the Mormon church, uh, what would be something you would ask him to figure out if what he attributes this experience to is actually correct? Because he thinks it's that it's that Mormonism is true, and that jo and that Jesus spoke to uh, Joseph Smith, and appeared to him like literally. I'm not sure I care. Why? Why? Why do I care what he believes? Why? Why am I investigating his claim? Well, let's do say, I do I care? Well, you're a Christian. <laughs> I just don't understand. I don't understand. Like, I had an experience that was satisfying, satisfyingly real to me. I don't doubt my experiences in life. I have no reason to doubt that experience that night. It wasn't drunk. Do you it wasn't care? high. Do you it care? Did, it did it. Wait, 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 wait. Let me explain. Let me explain myself. I wasn't drunk. I wasn't high, which I very easily could have been. And the transformation in me, according to all my friends and family, was dramatic and good. I stopped smoking. I stopped drinking. I became a better person. My brother-in-law was so profoundly convinced that something real had happened to me that he came out to California and became a Christian on the spot. Very well-educated person, Wharton School of Finance, went back a Christian. Everybody said the change in him, same thing, more compassionate, more caring human being. Are there some things that we might believe within the context of Christianity that potentially false? Yeah, irrelevant, <laughs> irrelevant. I don't care if like, you know, the, 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 some of the, the side issues of Christianity. And I don't particularly care about, you know, do I care about Joseph Smith? And I mean, it's false teaching, but it's the, the Mormons who are practicing Mormonism on the ground floor, are they potentially reading the Bible and doing real things inspired by the teachings of Jesus? Potentially. And then that would be cool in my sight. I'd be cool with them. You know, if there's a Mormon who's listening and they were, if I thought they were acting in a way that was Christ-like or good or compassionate, I'd be cool with them. I, I don't really care about their side doctrines at all. That's not, that's, not where, that's not where I'm at. That's where other Christians are at. It's not where I'm at. I don't care. Okay. Those things aren't important to me. Okay, so you don't care if it's true or not for the Mormon or what he attributes his experiences to. Let's get back to you then. Um, you, care, you told me earlier that you do care if what you attributed your experience to is true or not or correct, right? Did you say that? My, my experience was 150% to me true, to the point of absolute conviction. Now, how is Doug going to get past this? You have to, if you know Craig Reed, what you know about Craig Reed is, is he's been a Christian, I think, over 20 years. Uh, he used to do drugs and alcohol and all this kind of stuff in his 20s. He was partying, doing all kinds of crazy things. And then he had a spiritual experience, which completely transformed him. So he hasn't had a drop of alcohol or any drugs in decades. And his in-laws found this shocking and actually converted themselves. So that's his story, which I think is very compelling. It's clearly something that he believes uh, 150 percent as he's pointing out so how is doug going to get past this let's find out let's yeah. let's separate does that mean let's separate. does that mean does that mean it's true for you no does that mean i expect you to believe me no this is what i was trying to explain to dan and uh drew last night right but let me the explain that i'm trying to let me explain to you why um we've got to first separate two things there's an experience okay go ahead there's right. an there's an experience and then there's what you attribute that experience, what caused it, right? Those are two separate things. What caused the experience and right. the experience itself. So you had, right. some, you had some experience. Can you come up with another explanation other than the Holy Spirit, a Holy Spirit for your, that experience? Just a possibility. So he doesn't want to come up with another explanation. That is one of the tactics that's used. He's trying to, of course, put a wedge between Craig and the experience that he had and trying to put some doubts in his mind. That's a street epistemology tactic. And so let's keep going.
in that um, that would be that believably the Holy Spirit to me? Not probably not. What where where are you trying to take me? Where where are you going? Well, I, uh, probably not. Well, we have an effect. So you, you're start you're still you're still starting with in your mind. It's not a real. It wasn't a really supernatural experience, and you're still starting with the premise that you're going to prove to me that it wasn't by leading me down a path. That's not an honest present pre premise for a scientist. So the interesting thing is there are two people here and both have presuppositions uh, right now. Now, Paul, I'm sorry, uh, Craig has a pre presupposition that Jesus is true and that he had a spiritual experience with the Holy Spirit. Let us recall something really important. He was not searching for Christianity necessarily when he had this experience, okay? So he wasn't a Christian for many years. He actually was kind of agnostic and he was hanging around doing all kinds of things and he started having these experiences. And he says now he regularly has spiritual experiences. Now, Doug has a presupposition that God is untrue and he's a classic example of what is pointed out in Romans 1.20, where God allows people to walk away if they so desire to. They can uh, stifle the information that he's given to them. They can squelch their spiritual experiences, and they can try to attribute them to other things. Now, because Doug has walked away, God has sent a, what they call a powerful delusion. And in the powerful delusion, Doug is unable to actually see uh, or or understand what's going on with the believer other than to attribute it to something that he would view himself as this must come from outside it must be some other source so let's keep going you should start from zero you should start from pure maybe craig, not he didn't have a christian craig, experience i'm going to show him craig i'm going to start assume, from maybe i'm going to assume you should start from maybe craig i'm going to assume from this point forwards that it, that the holy spirit is real that christianity is true from this point forwards i'm going to I'm going to enter that paradigm. Okay. Christianity is okay. true, and the Holy Hallelujah, Spirit. Hallelujah! You're converted. Okay. Hallelujah. But I'm still going okay. to. Okay. Give me tides. Give me some tides. Okay. So, I, but I'm still going to ask you questions to challenge you to critically examine your experience, because it, I think you and I would both agree that the Christianity could be true, and the Holy Spirit's real, and that it might have had nothing, nothing to do with your experience that night. Do you agree right, with but that? you're misunderstanding. Okay, but you're misunderstanding the premise of of where of why, what my whole reason debt is. Okay, you're trying to examine my faith experience under a microscope. I didn't necessarily say that's what I wanted you to do, or that's acceptable. Or do you want to do that? I'll stop right now if you want me to stop. I I I want you to recognize I'm trying to present to you two separate paths. One, intellectual, that we can both agree on the facts, objectively of verifiable facts. Intellectual experience of God prior to me becoming a conviction, where Jordan Peterson is at now. That's where the supernatural, the supernatural warrant that I'm going to try to build is to be found. It is not in the faith experience. The faith experience happens by faith. You can't rationalize it away, and you can't examine it under a microscope. You either believe me or you don't. We haven't defined it's, faith it's yet, not have work. we? What do you exactly mean when well, you use do that you, word? Do you, agree, do, you, do you agree with what I just said? It depends I on mean, what you mean by faith. Awful lot of commercials on this, this station, unfortunately. So I jumped ahead just a little bit. I'm willing that's to stop. I'm willing, what I perceive. I'm willing to stop right what now I perceive. If you want to stop, we can stop. We can go. We can go. I, I, I'm, am I allowed to critique what my what's happening to me from a place of honesty? Because that's all I'm doing. I, I'm sorry if that's that doesn't sound fair to you, but that's what I'm honestly experiencing. I kind of get why people get defensive now, because I I sense you you tell me you're honest, but I don't sense that you actually are. I what, sense that you want what would I have to, to prove do? me wrong. What would I have to do you or want say to prove me wrong? That's not an actual scientifically. That's not science. I've decided he's wrong. Let me now prove it. Just because you're doing it subtly and skillfully doesn't mean that's not what you want to do. You said I want to really know if the Holy Spirit is real. I can I can lead you there intellectually easily. You're smart enough. I can. So you don't really want to know. You want to prove me wrong. That's not that's not completely intellectually honest of you. 
So right now we're on Digital Gnosis is channeled. That is Nathan Ormond and looks like Pine Creek has made a stop by. So let's see what he has to say. He's gonna be uh, given a quiz from Converse Contender. And then he's, just, he's his turn again to ask a question, I guess, right? Or do we move on? I can, yeah, I, I can yeah. answer and then just yeah. call someone else to ask a question. Yeah, so um, with the last time we spoke about the library um, experiment, it's like, um, it's always goes, it always goes like, well, which shelf does the religion go on the fiction or nonfiction or whatever. Right. And so I would just say like, which shelf does, um, you know, other improbable, uh, things go on like, uh, evolution, this world being created from things we don't understand, like universe coming into being and then evolving into creatures that can, uh, self can, um, you know, reflect on the things that happened, that this all occurred. And then by no, uh, intelligence like which shelf does that go on fiction or nonfiction? evolution it goes on nonfiction. okay so james Fodor, you're next <laughs> that was quick how, how do you connect that to god rob um because like if i if i have that experience and even you describing it there doesn't really tell me anything about about God. You know, do you, do you think someone can have that experience and it not be to do with God? Sure. And for for example, Does when I mentioned the Tao, right, the Chinese Tao, what I find interesting in their literature is they are frustrated of how impersonal the the Tao Tao concept is. So when the missionaries come to China, like, hey, we have this model that says the Tao becomes flesh. Boom, that just re revolutionizes that. But but your question, I think, is a very good one because you're really getting to the heart of the issues. Okay, I want to then come talk directly to the Tao's face. <laughs> and, well, no, it, and it's think, more like how could you tell if God just isn't there and you're still having this experience? Like, I, you know, like, and then for me, who doesn't think God's there, how are you connecting God to that experience? And can you then describe that so I can also know this God's there? And you know, by you having this experience. So that is a pretty bold claim on your point. Notice you are, uh, uh, so it's a hypothetical, right? But then I I think you'd be honest in saying that you don't know if God doesn't exist. You can't, you know, prove that, right? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I, well, I, I mean, it could be the case that someone can prove it, but I certainly can't, yeah. yeah. So I'm just going by the fact that we have this experience regardless. And based on the uh, the uh, estimation of, say, historical context of the resurrection, all that stuff. So in other words, I see this as a, as a model, just like how we do models in science. And then I find the model is coherent, and then I go from there with it. So, so is there some like prediction that your model would make that like a naturalist model wouldn't make that then we could both kind of look to and then we could say, well, th this model that you've got is actually better than the one that the naturalist has. This is why I asked you about Genesis 1 and how that leads into, you know, everything else. Rob, God told me that he cut you off years ago. <laughs> Prove it. <laughs> he hasn't he hasn't heard your prayers he hasn't helped you he hasn't guided you the holy spirit has been out of you for the last 10 years no five years he told me five years how would you know the difference Listen, this, this is a new approach slick dog here we go well you have to verify uh the psychology of my thought process for the last 10 years Right. You truly, your psychology was you truly believed he was there for you. He was guiding you and directing you. you and... No, no, no. You need to show every permutation of every minute of my life for the last 10 years to verify that God did indeed tell you that. Because I know my mind for the last 10 years. You know your mind for the last 10 years that God was there for you? Yeah. How do you know that? Because he told me well, otherwise. Well, you need you need to sit with me one day and walk with me to come into my shoes and see oh, how Oh, you know out. what? That's a great idea. I'd love to do that with a lot of Christians, especially when they walk into Pentecostal churches or any type of church and they see the certain things happen. I go, yeah, right. Sorry yeah, to interrupt, so guys. Oh, it's unmuted. Wait, no, I'm muted. Very confusing. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I got to run off. Uh, just as it's getting interesting as well, but thanks for the chat, guys. Um, and Nathan, I yeah, will I will good. reply to your email. Sorry about that. It's been a bit messy <laughs> no, with you. Hey, James. See you, mate. See you a bit. Wait. Hey, James. Yeah, yeah so I, you're presuming you're presuming I'm a uh, a, a Pentecostal. No, type. no, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not. I know you're not. Okay. But I'm just saying that as an example, there's so many things that 
a guy like me walking next to a Christian person, they would they would see God in everything, or not everything, but a lot of things. And I'd say, no, come on, no, no. And see, Doug is in the minority. Uh, he's one of seven percent. He's in the seven percent of the world who actually do not believe that God exists. And uh, Rob is in the majority. Rob believes that God exists. In fact, Rob is a really uh, ardent Christian. Rob is of Sentinel Apologetics. I highly recommend heading on over to his channel along with Converse Contender if you want some Christian information. And if you are interested in more atheistic information or agnostic, you can, of course, listen to Nathan Orman's channel. That's a channel that we're on right now. And so Doug's interactions with people are always trying to get them to doubt their faith and starting doubt. And so let's see some of his other approaches and then you can share in the chat what you think of them. Here's another episode on Digital Gnosis's channel. How many years have you been married, SJ? I wanna see if I oh, caught you a beat. 17 years. Oh, you're just a novice. <laughs> I'm, at, I'm uh, 26. That's not, that's good. It's impressive. Married, married longer than I've been alive. Yeah, exactly. I've 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 been having coitus before you were even uh, in existence. <laughs> you Don't ask for any tips because I still keep the lights off. <laughs> <laughs> and the music you know, really loud. <laughs> the music. <laughs> the music. No. Uh, He's giving us a little too much information. Just saying. <laughs> there's music. <laughs> bow, 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 bow. Suddenly, this this conversation is taking a nose dive. <laughs> well, well, guys, uh, no, um, SJ, do you not think listening to that though, like like um, Aaron's story, that you know, like Christi Christianity was in was competing with her well being, like for that in that situation? Do you not think that Christianity actually caused more harm than good there in in that kind of relationship? Yeah, I think, well, I think all relationships probably, I mean, there's probably something good that came out of that relationship. I don't know what it is, but it, I think that Aaron, I, I mean, I think even um, I dated the wrong people. And I think that even though I dated the wrong people, sometimes at least I feel like in each of those relationships, there was something that positive and something, I learned something out of it. So I at least tend to try to- My ex-husband introduced me to my current husband. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, in, a, in, in what kind of context? Um, they were in school together. Oh, okay. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah. So that was really, that was probably the best part about my first marriage is that it introduced me to my husband. <laughs> you We've guys have kids for now 10 too, years. don't you? Pardon? Don't you have kids now too? I do. Yeah. I have two kids. That's great. Doug, do you have kids? Yes. I have a 17 year old and a 14 year old. Okay. Huh. Are they still Christian, Doug, your kids? No. I led them to hell. Isn't your wife a Christian though, Doug? I think I've heard you say that. Yeah, but you know from the Christian worldview, S.J. Thompson. Actually, you're not as evangelical as as others. You you lean more Roman Catholic a bit, right? Well, I was raised in Roman Catholic, so. But basically, in the Christian circles I come from, uh, it's the father that will determine where the kids are headed in their eternal destinies. That's and in this case, they're right. So Although, you're. There's so, time. So none of your, because it's, I was just mentioning it in the faith that I just mentioned with my friend who's the Hindu, his wife's a Christian and their two kids chose to be Christians. They gave him a choice. And the, um, and then my friend, I've got another really good friend who's a Jew, a Jew, a Jewish girl. And she, she married a Christian and she convinced him to convert to Judaism and they raised their two children as, as Jews. I wonder how she did them. that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how she did that, but she with did the Holy it. Spirit, no doubt. She's, she's one of my best friends at my university. I just talked to her today for about an hour on the phone and she's, um, yeah, and I'm going to her son's, her second son's bar mitzvah. I went to the other one. I'm the only one she invites from our university. And it's kind of funny. I, I go there and I wear my cross. <laughs> so, do, do you ever think, SJ, that it's um, slightly suspicious that Judas, the one who betrays Jesus, is literally called the Jew? I, well, I mean, Jesus was a Jew. So. No, I know, but, but the one who betrays Jesus in this story is the Jew. Like, so ex-Christian Erin was raised as a Christian. She was actually in kind of a strict, seemed like a strict sort of Christian faith with a lot of adherents who had certain beliefs that required her to uh, take certain vows and do certain things that were very strict discipline 
uh, sort of Christianity. And she left Christian faith. And since then, she's been on people's channels. She's been on my channel. She's been on Craig Reed's channel. She's been on Seth Andrews channel and a number of other channels. I think she's even been on Pine Creek's channel. But right here, she's sharing some spiritual experiences that she had. Now, let me note something in case you haven't listened to what my conversation was recently with Dr. Michael Heiser, or even have read his books like Unseen Realm or Reversing Herman or any of those kind of things. But what you find out when you read certain passages in the Bible is you understand there really is a spiritual battle going on between good and evil. And you can look at Genesis 6, Genesis 10, Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 82, Psalm 89. You can look at Jesus when he also refers to the uh, sons of God. And you can look at a number of other passages that tell us basically that there was a spiritual, there is a spiritual world out there. There is an unseen realm. Uh, there are battles going on. God had at one point early on in uh, Genesis had seeded ground, uh, had given the sons of God places in the world where they were so, supposed to exercise authority. And throughout the story in a bunch of different verses, we learned that these spiritual beings that were exercising authority went awry, okay? And so God called them together in divine counsel in Psalm 82 and he scolded them. And then we know what happened was the most high uh, became flesh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that is Jesus. And so what Jesus did in his purpose of his ministry, one purpose was to reclaim the land that had been given to these spiritual beings because of how awful these beings had been acting. And so we do believe that there are other forces out there, okay? We do believe that there are spiritual beings trying to negatively impact this world. And that actually quite explains a lot of great things, explains a lot of things really well. And so when Erin shares her experience here, which, which implies that she had some sort of a, a spiritual experience, but with, uh, that brought out beliefs that are inconsistent with Christianity, those are consistent, actually, if you look at the biblical passages to which I'm referring. So let's keep going here. Like drop a key, and that's when the Holy Spirit would really move. <laughs> well, but, but Aaron, why, why is it then that you, so, so Craig was saying before that having like religious experiences is a reason to believe in God, but you've had these experiences and don't believe in God. Why is it that, um, you know, you don't believe that they were caused by a deity or by Jesus, these experiences? that you um, The thing that caused me to reconsider that was I started having experiences outside of the Christian framework. So now let's look at Doug here. She says she's having experiences outside the Christian framework. Now, when Craig said he was having experiences inside the Christian framework, Doug doubted those. And of course, when I said I had experiences, Doug didn't doubt those. So is Doug going to doubt her experiences outside the Christian framework? This is the big question that we must address because if he uh, does not doubt the experiences outside the framework, but does doubt the experiences within the framework, something is a strange, okay? Something's a little strange here. Right? Think about this. Why would he deny the Christian experiences and okay or accept non-Christian experiences? Now, I'm not sure he's going to do that, but I'm sure he's going to do that. Let's watch. Um, I one time had an experience seeing a band. Uh, so early on in my kind of deconstruction, I went to one of my favorite bands. I went to the concert and I, I spent that whole evening like just in tears and <laughs> like I was like shaking. I, like, I, loved, I loved it so much. Um, what band? The yeah. 1975. Oh, really? Yeah. I was going to say, um, sounds like you too. No, it's just a band that I was like, and I still really love them. They're, they're great. Um, that concert. And then, I mean, I also got really into meditating a couple of years ago. So I spent a, just a ton of time doing um, those kind of practices. And I had, I had a couple experiences that I was like, they were just so profound for me. Um, the other kind of strange thing was, as I, I've, I can, I can, I, I've lucid, I've, I still do. I can lucid dream. Okay, so far we've got that she had an experience when she was watching a band. She has sort of a spiritual experience in some way. She can do lucid dreams and she meditates. And so she hasn't given us that much information. And this is not that unusual. I have lucid dreams sometimes and I could certainly meditate and still be with, consistent with my, my Christianity. If I went to watch a band and I felt some sort of a emotion digging up inside of me or welling up inside of me and I attributed it to a spiritual experience, so be it. It still could be consistent with my Christian faith. And so let's see what happens here. I've had experiences that some people would describe as astral projection and just none of that fit into my Christian framework. And some of them were more powerful. And 
astral projection could fit into a Christian framework uh, in a way because we can explain those sorts of things that go on. A lot of times people have near death experiences where they feel as if their body is in a different place. Uh, they sometimes can say, hey, I saw myself looking down at myself in the hospital room, or I saw a pair of shoes up on top of the hospital. It was something that they couldn't have possibly have known from inside the body in which they were, uh, you know, had been freed from. And so that could be an example of an astral projection. It's this idea that you can sort of go to a distant place. Now, that could also be something that you might experience if you're playing with the occult or you're involved in other sort of spiritual practices that could happen. So that could be something that you see right there. So let's take a look at Doug's response to this. More real to me than my experiences uh, in 30 years at the church. So that was, that was just, I'm not saying that I think that those things are more true or, um, but they were powerful enough that it caused me to kind of reevaluate my, all my experiences. Okay, so she's saying, hey, I had a powerful astral projection. I am meditating and I had an experience while watching 1975 and I have lucid dreams. And so based on all of this, she's decided that she's had experiences that counter Christianity. However, I again would make the argument that those don't counter Christianity. I'm not even, uh, I'm not even sure what argument she could make that they do. She hasn't actually gotten into that, but let's see what Doug says. Sounds you know, I like it's pretty good theater too. to me. Oh, oh, that sounds like a pretty good defeater to him. Got it. Uh huh. Now we're back on Doug's channel. So, does Jesus love me or hate me? Because I'm doing those things. Like, you can say he hates my eyes and my tongue and my hands and my feet and my heart. But how do you get th through that last part? Jesus hates the person. Okay, here we People go. People, they're searching. What are they oh, that's not the right one. I got a whole bunch of this guy. I, years ago, we, we had a track that showed the ark. Lightning, dark clouds, the rain is falling. And there are men and women desperate as the waters are rising trying to get into the ark. And on the side of it, is a smiley face that says, smile, God loves you. It was not, that track was not made to be funny. It was made to show how foolish so much of modern day evangelism is. Yeah, you know what he's saying here? Do you guys understand, you flag waving phony Christians listening right now? You know what he's saying to you? He's saying you're foolish. If you preach a gospel that says Jesus loves you, no, <laughs> no, 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 Jesus hates you. And it's only by grace that he loves you. Before the foundations of the earth, before you were even born, before you even had a thought, Jesus chose you to be regenerate and accept salvation. Those people he loves. Let's be clear. It's those people he loves. But me? No, 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 no. See, Doug is one of the things that, that's offered in the Bible. If you go to John 3, 16, it said, For God so loves the world that he gave his one and only son. For whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, that's really clear that it's offered to the whole world. Now, can people walk away? Can people choose to reject Jesus' offer of grace? Well, certainly. Heaven wouldn't be heaven if God forced its inhabitants to be there. But what is it like to reject God? What kind of existence is that? People say, well, God would send me to hell. Why would God send me to hell? God doesn't send you to hell. God just doesn't force you to go to heaven. You're in the existence without God, if you choose so, after this life. Now, just know something. One of the things that we know in the Bible that's mentioned a number of times is that children of the light are, uh, the light is within them. And Helen Keller, who was blind and deaf, realized that she had a certain light within her. And that light is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. And so we've all got this light within us. We've got a sense of love. And that is something that everyone has. Doug even has it. Doug's got a sense of love inside of him. However, if you choose to reject the light and uh, after this life, and you want an existence without God, you're gonna have an existence without the standard of truth justice, love, forgiveness, 
uh, and everything else that we care about. All those standards are gone. So what sort of existence would this be without a standard uh, to, to appeal to? Okay, you can appeal to that standard when it's something that's transcended to us and it's something that's pervasive throughout all societies. Okay, because we have a moral transcendent lawgiver. So we can appeal to that standard. We can say, hey, you're not telling the truth. Hey, you're not being fair. You're not being just. You're not being benevolent. You're not being loving. We're appealing to a standard. Imagine an existence. Just do a little exist, a little exercise. Imagine an existence where the standard's no longer there. And the only presence that you feel is the presence of darkness and the presence of uh, the enemy, okay? And so the enemy doesn't live by those standards and so you certainly couldn't appeal to those standards to appeal to the enemy. And so if you think that the existence is gonna be pleasant, you've got something coming. Now you have a chance. You can, God said, just repent, repent. It's not that hard to do. Repent of your errors. Take, let God get in control and let him move through you. Okay, so here we go. Let's keep going with what Doug has to say here. Now, he thinks that he's the instigator. He's aligning himself up. He mentioned it at the outset here in this video. He is aligning himself up with the enemy, the evil one. So let's see what he says here. Jesus doesn't love me. He hates me. Just like Jesus hated the people, whether it was a global flood, a regional flood, Jesus hated the people that he drowned that day. Let's not forget something really important, a, a couple of things. One of the reasons why we see what, ha what happened uh, in the Noah's Ark, number one, God is omniscient. Number two, we know from other verses in the Bible that God waited until the very last minute, uh, like for example, to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah until there was no one left who was worthy of redemption. No one left who would have repented. Uh, no one who was ready to give up the horrific sins that they were doing back in those days. Okay, like if we go to Canaanite times, for example, people were routinely uh, prostituting themselves in the temple as they worship to the gods who were incestuous and committing bestiality in these temples. Okay, they were sacrificing their kids to the god Baal. They were doing a lot of really horrific things. So God in his mercy decided that he would end their time on this planet, okay, and, and bring like infants, for example, the infants would now be with him in paradise. And so the existence in paradise is much more pleasant than this planet. This planet has the presence of good and evil. Uh, it's got the presence of a lot of people who are trying to stifle your trip to heaven. And so those are just a few of the things you want to consider right here. Also consider the fact that as the person uh, that God is, knowing exactly what the outcomes can be of our life because he's omniscient, he knows what's best for us. And he's the one who is able to control the beginning of our life and the end of our life. He's fully omniscient and he's fully in control. And he knows exactly how you're going to live out your life now because he's concurrently in the past, present, and future. Unlike all these other gods that are not worthy of worship, the most high God is completely eternal, all-powerful, omniscient, and all-loving, okay? So uh, the, in his great mercy, he put those people out of their, the doom that they were experiencing. That month, whatever. Isn't it interesting? This is the tension here. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You could take that same verse and say, for God so hated the world that he brought forth flooding waters that whosoever didn't believe in, in him will perish and not have everlasting life. Both are true. I dare Christians to disagree with that. Unless you just throw out the whole, unless I'm talking to Marcionite Christians out there, but there's no Marcionites out there, right? Unless you just want to throw out the whole Old, Old Testament and say you have no foundation for the New Testament because you can't have a New Testament without the Old Testament. When you go out into this world and you tell people to smile because God loves Oh, oh, Pablo Hendrickson. I love that name. Hendrickson. That's a, that's a real name. Uh, he's saying in the live stream chat, they are Calvinist, Pine Creek. They are not Christians. <gasps> now who's stirring up division? A heart that devises wicked schemes. God doesn't hate Pine Creek. He just hates my heart. Because this whole YouTube live stream right now is a wicked scheme from Satan. Like he, This was your idea, right? Well, yeah, I know a subscriber told me to play Tim Conway.
but you put that thought in, in the subscriber's head? Oh man, Satan, you have so much influence on the world. How do you do that? Talent. Yeah, Satan has talent. Um, a heart that devises wicked schemes. That's Pine Creek. So J Jesus doesn't hate Pine Creek. He hates my heart. When I devise wicked schemes, which is almost always when I'm live, feet that are quick to rush into evil. See, Jesus doesn't hate Pine Creek. He hates my feet because my feet always rush into evil. Oh, my, now, hey, listen, Spartan Theology, this is going to be a tough one to get around. Jesus doesn't hate Pine Creek, but he hates a false witness who pours out lies. Am I a false witness? Do I pour out lies? Well, if you talk to some Christians, I pour out lies all the time. There's probably some Christians in here right now saying I'm pouring out lies by taking this out of context. Well, but I'm just following Tim Conway's lead. I, and I see this is the funny thing. It's it's almost like self-incrimination and trying to say there's Christians here are saying it's taken out of context. It says right here, this is a verse. It says there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable. And so he listed the things that the Lord does not like. We all know that the Lord does not like this. You can take this verse. I'm not going to worry about this coming out of context because everything in it is quite clear. There's a lot of meaning to it. Okay, so let's continue. And a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Oh, that's definitely me. So Jesus, remember, uh, by the way, for the, for the Christians from Alabama, uh, Jesus is God, and God is Yahweh. Jesus is Yahweh. This is the Old Testament, so this, it's okay for me to say this in terms of Jesus. So Jesus hates a person, hates a person, not what they do. He hates the actual person who stirs up conflict in the community. Now look at me right now. What am I doing? I'm stirring. <laughs> And on that note, I hope that you'll like, subscribe, and do come again. I appreciate that you're here. So whether you eat, drink, and whatever you do, do it all in the glory of God.